Dr. Okay. Badman, take it away. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Vijay Bataman. I'm the Senior Executive Vice Chair of the Deming Department of Medicine. I want to welcome you to today's uh, Medical Grand Rounds. This month, our Grand Rounds presentations will continue to be on COVID-related topics. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce to you two of our critical care medicine faculty who are in the front lines of our battle with this pandemic. They will present to us summarizing experiences in COVID-19 critical care. Our first presenter will be Dr. Christine Bojanowski. She's an assistant professor of medicine and associate director of Tulane Adult Cystic Fibrosis Program. She will be followed by Dr. Joshua Denson, also an assistant professor of medicine and associate director, pulmonary critical care medicine fellowship program. Both are also roadmap scholars. And I'm very happy to start with uh, Dr. Christine Bojanowski's presentation. Thank you. Is there any way to, am I not on mute now? You're good. Oh, you can hear me, great. Um, thank you so much everyone for joining, joining us and zooming in or tuning in to Facebook this afternoon for our Grand Rounds today um, where Dr. Denson and I will be talking about our experiences and um, what knowledge that we have um, about um, critical care in the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, with this, I have no disclosures, but I do have one big disclaimer. Dr. Bottoman before, um, before this sent a gentle reminder not to have overcrowded slides. Um, and so the way I'm leading this off is with one huge overcrowded slide. Um, I think often what we end up doing is saving thank yous to the end of a presentation where they end up getting skimmed over. But I really think this is an important time to acknowledge each of, each of us and each other in this as a community um, for everything that we're doing day to day during this, this unbelievable time. Um, this has been an incredibly humbling experience. Um, I'm so thankful to the Tulane leadership, Dr. Bodeman, for especially again for inviting us to speak with you today. Um, our thought leaders, we have incredible scientists at, at Tulane that I know will be pushing forward um, and getting us answers um, and getting us treatment options. Um, of course, I want to thank our section, Pulmonary Critical Care Environmental Medicine, and uh, my colleagues um, who um, have all stepped up for our, for our patients, for our hospitals, um, and for each other. Um, I want to thank also our fellow physicians and faculty members, um, the other ICU services, surgical and neurocritical care that have really stepped up, um, infectious disease, um, Dr. Mushat, Dr. Uh, Fusco especially. Um, to our trainees who um, I have just been absolutely blown away by, our fellows who I work most closely with and the residents I've been able to work with over the past several days. Um, uh, the amount of professionalism and true grit has been unlike that of which I've ever seen before. Um, also a big shout out to the medical students that, are, uh, that have been helping with um, trying to get, uh, volunteer in any way that they can with um, getting us protective uh, equipment for trying to hop in on research um, initiatives um, where they're able to do that. Um, when I walk into the hospital, really I'm just overwhelmed um, by everyone that I encounter. Um, and I've just been so impressed. I'm so thankful to our administrators here in the hospital, um, you know, especially to Charlene who has been so helpful during this time. Um, and I also want to give a special acknowledgement to our research coordinators and regulatory staff that have been really working hard to push um, protocols and studies and trials through the IRB. So um, this is data that is updated daily through the State Health Department and it's available online. Dr. Mushad, I believe last week presented the slide on the left uh, during Grand Rounds. Um, and I wanted to put these side by side with the most up to date with the data that we have from yesterday. Um, now, you can blame me on the um, uh, kind of uh, amusement park uh, distortion of Louisiana that I've created here with the shrinking and the stretching. Um, but I really want to call your attention to the cases here. 
So on March 25th, we had a, a 1,700, almost 1,800 cases. Now we're at over 5,000. Our deaths, uh, death rates increased from 65 to 239. Our patients that are hospitalized went from 491 to 1,355 in a matter of six days. And of those, 163 of those were on ventilators last week, and now we're at 438. So these are truly unprecedented times. And the point of reviewing this, this data and this information is to highlight that what we're seeing is the growth um, in the rate, the growth rate of the cases that we're seeing are just way ahead of the available data that we have, the high quality research trials that we want to have guiding us during this time, and even the resources. So my objectives, brief, very briefly, are to review mortality estimates, to review very briefly, again, the clinical spectrum of COVID-19 disease um, or COVID-19, uh, to discuss some of the critical care complications that we're seeing of COVID-19, and to give a brief update on treatment trials. Now, this is collective data from China um, that, uh, included confirmed, confirmed cases from the early period of the outbreak of the disease up until February of uh, last month. Um, this is a description of 44,000 confirmed cases nationwide in China. Um, you know, I think with some variability overall, this triangle really does hold true. The majority of cases, um, you know, these are particularly in the community, um, are, are mild, 81%. We're not seeing that. Um, in our hospitals. So it's this 14% of the severe cases, people that are having hypoxic respiratory failure, significant dyspnea, uh, uh, and um, worsening clinical symptoms that we're seeing. Of those, an additional 5% are critical cases with um, fulminant respiratory failure, septic shock, um, multiple organ dysfunction, and failure as well. Um, now, all of, out of all of this, um, the estimated um, the, the estimated deaths uh, that occurred out of these critical care cases was about 50%. But overall, the, the case fatality rate um, with this data that we have available is 2.3% um, of all cases. Um, now, just to give kind of a cross-sectional view, our slice of this top bit of the triangle from Tulane Medical Center, um, thank you. Um, uh, so much, Dr. Malden, for um, providing this um, information to me. So to date, we've had 222 cases admitted to Tulane. On 331, that was yesterday, we had 74 patients that were total, uh, that were positive or PUI. Um, we had uh, 19 patients in the ICU. Of those, um, 16 were on ventilators. Um, on the med surge floor, we had an additional 38 patients that were uh, confirmed positive or PUI. We had one death. Um, we had, we are seeing just constant admissions every day. So we had 30 admissions that were related to coronavirus yesterday, and we were able to have two discharges, which is a big win. So really, again, just looking at some early mortality data, the World Health, Organi uh, World Health Organization declared uh, COVID-19 a pandemic on March 11th. On March 12th, based on World Health or, uh, data that they had at that time, there were 125,000 um, confirmed uh, cases worldwide um, with a mortality that they estimated of about 3.7%. Um, this is um, higher than the 1% the that's been estimated for influenza in the past. Now there is definite variability within regions anywhere from below 1% to greater than or, or closer to 6% in, in highly impacted areas such as in Wuhan. Um, I think across the board, despite the variability that we see um, in this, the fluctuation in the mortality rates, um, you know, one thing that we can definitely agree on or, or can say um, with certainty is that the, the case fatality rate is the highest among the minority of people that have um, severe disease with COVID. Um, on data that has, um, that is, uh, that has made, been made available from, again, mainly smaller studies, um, in some case series, but um, these were some good studies that had come out of uh, China. Overall, in-hospital mortality 
um, both med surge and um, ICU was a, was has been quoted around 28%. In the critically ill, um, it's, a, it's about 50%, upwards of 62% in some studies. Um, and the mortality in those requiring mechanical ventilation is much higher, ranging anywhere from 81% to 97%. Um, there was um, a group that published uh, recently in the New England Journal of Medicine just two days ago on their experiences in Seattle. This is a multi-center case series that had nine different hospitals that were included in this, a total of 24 patients um, following um, their um, hospital course um, for a period of 31 days. Um, some highlights here that uh, were very interesting to take out of the paper, but not 100% um, evident from this slide in itself is that the median length of hospital stay among the survivors is about 17 days. The median length of ICU stay among um, the survivors is about 14 days. The, the median duration of mechanical ventilation um, was 10 days. Um, out of this group of patients, um, six patients had been extubated by the end of the study period. 50% um, had died, um, which is in line with the, the prior data. Four, four, uh, four patients or 70% had actually been discharged from the ICU but were still in the hospital. And um, actually 5% or 21, five patients or 21% had been discharged from the hospital. Um, the real take home point from this is that um, these hospital stays are long. Um, we are, uh, they are, when they come to the ICU, they're with us for um, a long period of time. When they're in the hospital with us, they're, they're with us for a long time as well. Um, just looking at kind of these uh, general overview of the uh, complication development of COVID-19. Um, this is data coming out of China, two different studies. Um, I think what we're, sh what we're seeing pretty consistently is that COVID-19 is showing respiratory um, deterioration around day seven to day nine of, of um, after illness onset um, with worsening dyspnea, increasing oxygen requirements. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, as we follow over time, these are survivors above here and these are non-survivors below here. We're seeing, and I don't think this is, um, you know, too, this is, not, this is uh, not incredibly significant, but we're seeing sepsis and ARDS developing later, um, mildly so, or just uh, uh, in patients that are non-survivors. And then we're also seeing development of other complications like acute cardiac injury, acute kidney injury, secondary infections, and death. Um, and this study here, these are, this is data of non-survivors out of the ICU. Um, and what this is showing is that the median duration of ICU admission until death in the patients that are not surviving is about seven days. So I think up front, we're all very comfortable with, um, with data that was showing us that um, it, it seemed to be that uh, the elderly were not doing as well um, in, in this disease. And I think we were kind of hanging our hat on that to some degree. Um, and I think that's evolving and developing. We are definitely seeing younger cases in our ICUs. Um, this is uh, data that came out of the CDC um, just recently uh, made available um, with 4,226 cases that were reported and with what available data that they were able to uh, get complete outcomes on. What we see here is um, about 31% of the cases, oh, sorry, I'm not using my pointer here, about 31% of the cases um, requiring, uh, or 31% of the cases overall um, are in the group um, over the age of 65. 45% um, of hospitalizations, um, up to 53% of ICU admissions, and 80% of deaths are um, found in those uh, adults that are greater than the age of 65. Um, and, um, you know, so I do think that that, um, that does hold true and that is what we're seeing. Um, looking at ICU non-survivors versus survivors, um, you know, age, as I was saying, we are seeing um, younger patients, younger, sicker patients. Um, I think age still holds true, uh, absolutely, as a, as a higher um, a predictor of um, severity of disease or mortality from the disease when severe. Um, but there are other um, 
there are other um, factors that are associated with um, what we're seeing in terms of non-survivors versus survivors in the ICU. Um, comorbidities are, are definitely being discussed more um, and being recognized um, you know, more readily at this point, diabetes, um, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, COPD, cerebrovascular disease, um, and obesity, which we're definitely seeing here in our patient populations. Um, patients that, uh, will not that do not survive this um, are more likely to develop ARDS, um, are more likely to require mechanical ventilation, and are more likely to have other organ function dysfunction. Um, most notably uh, kidney injury, uh, cardiac injury, and liver dysfunction. Um, we're not really seeing any type of differences between ICU survivors and non-survivors um, based on median duration from onset of symptoms to radiological confirmation. Um, we're not seeing any major differences as well from the median duration of onset of symptoms to ICU admission. We're also not seeing significant differences in lymphocytopenia, which is pretty um, uh, common in most of the patients with this disease. Um, I'm not going to delve too much into uh, respiratory failure. I'm going to leave that to Dr. Denson, who um, will be presenting right after this. But it is the leading cause of mortality. And simply on that, um, chest imaging is kind of a typical image that you would see from a patient with this, um, you know, uh, viral pneumonitis and this um, bilateral opacities. Um, we are seeing a lot of shock. In Seattle, they reported up to 70% of their patients um, required um, vasopressor support, and that is without the clear evidence of secondary infection. Um, we, do sub, you know, we do recognize that we are requiring high amounts of sedation um, to, for, um, to be able to successfully manage these patients um, on the ventilator. Um, in their study, they did report a, a much lower number, maybe about 15 or 18 percent, they found to be um, associated with uh, sedative use. Um, renal injury and failure. Um, there has been um, some published data and reports showing that among all patients that are requiring any degree of hospitalization, um, about 15% will have some negative impact or injury to their kidneys. This is much higher in the ICU. As I showed in the last slide, um, these numbers go up to about 30% or can go up to about 30%. Um, obviously, um, you know, we are in the thick of it now, so we don't know what the long-term health effects of kidney injury or really any of these um, complications are at this point. Um, one thing that is that we are seeing that is very interesting and of note um, we are seeing abnormal coagulation in our patients in the, in the unit. Um, critically ill patients with COVID-19 at a higher risk for thrombosis and also for bleeding. This is some data just showing um, the split in non-survivors in red and survivors in blue um, by D-dimer. Um, so we're seeing higher elevated um, D-dimer levels in non-survivors. Now, do you D-dimer is very simply, is it just an indication of, of, of a blood clot? Possibly, but I, I think this really is a non, as I think we would all agree upon, it's a very non-specific marker of inflammation or infection. There was one study that published that uh, out of their cohort of patients, of all of the patients, um, either being outpatient tested, coming into the hospital, or in the, um, they, they found about 3% of all of their COVID uh, positive patients had some type of um, thrombus or thrombotic um, uh, thrombus that was identified on ultrasound. This incidence is elevated in critically ill patients. They, they, um, they cited about 20% um, in, in their study. And Dr. Lasky is heading a study here on um, looking specifically at this, and I think what he's seeing as well and what we're seeing here is about the same incidence, um, uh, higher than we would have um, anticipated uh, previously, but um, greater than 20%. Um, acute myocarditis, this has really come out of um, case reports. Um, uh, in the literature at this point um, on my review. Um, so acute myocarditis, you can have focal or global myocardial inflammation, necrosis, ventricular dysfunction. Um, what this image is showing here is just this hyperintensity of the biventricular wall, um, which just suggests interstitial edema and this inflammation. Um, let me keep 
is going. Um, with acute myocarditis, there's a wide spectrum of clinical presentations from something as simple as chest pain to arrhythmias to advanced uh, heart failure uh, requiring advanced um, critical care management um, for that. The pathogenesis, um, some really interesting theories. Um, the, the process of repli this is just part of the process of the replication and dissemination of the virus. Um, you know, acute myocarditis has been seen in influenza cases. Um, to date, there are, really, there are no reports of influenza or coronavirus RNA in the heart um, available for, for um, to add to this comment. Um, is it more likely just a, a reflection of the exaggerated inflammatory response that we're seeing causing this myocardial image injury? And I think that's probably more likely the case. Um, this slide, uh, was, uh, this was published by Siddiqui in the journal of Heart Lung Transplant um, within the past month. And I think it's actually just a really great, um, albeit first stab at um, just trying to frame um, this disease progression in the clinical course. Um, and obviously I'm uh, biased and I'm uh, on this end of the spectrum, so I'm really looking at this inflammatory response phase where we're seeing more of the, um, serious clinical complications like ARDS, shock, cardiac failure, um, the elevated inflammatory markers as well. Um, this slide is nice because it, it does go over some potential therapies, um, which I'm not gonna be covering today. So looking at um, just going into this just uh, briefly a little bit more in depth. So we are really seeing a hyperinflammatory syndrome with multi-organ failure in many of our patients. Um, COVID-19 patients are showing lab profiles um, and kind of clinical courses very similar to secondary HL HLH. Um, secondary HLH in adults is most commonly triggered by viral infections. Um, so I don't think that this is um, necessarily a surprise that we're seeing this, um, but um, it is definitely something that we uh, um, are seeing. The clinical features um, of HLH and just this systemic hyperinflation uh, persistent unremitting fever, cytopenias, um, high, elevate, high um, levels of ferritin and pulmonary involvement in about 50% of patients. Um, you know, what we've been trying to do um, is also just looking at H scores and calculating H scores um, with um, thinking that the best cutoff, uh, you know, in general for H scores is, is on the higher end of 169 corresponding to um, a pretty good sensitivity for this type of a syndrome. But this um, is something that we should be looking at regularly and addressing um, and using this to help guide our decisions about what we're going to try in terms of immunosuppression if we're gonna try steroids and if they're appropriate. Um, some of the labs that we're seeing in our patients, um, the most common are lymphopenia. I think this is um, widely recognized and um, has been talked about. Um, in upwards of 80% of the patients, we're seeing lymphopenia. We're also seeing transaminitis very commonly. Procalcitonin, just as a reminder, is typically low to normal in these patients. So looking at the labs that really focus on this hyperinflation and the cytokine storm, these are, um, this is some data that was published out of the, uh, from um, Dr. Zhu in, uh, in the Lancet recently. Again, non-survivors are in red blue or the survivors. And what we're seeing across the board, um, very high, this is the high elevation of the D-dimer, which I showed earlier, um, high elevation of serum ferritin, which um, is a, a, an important marker and is um, certainly showing itself to be that way, um, elevation in high sensitivity uh, CRP, um, elevation in lactic, uh, lactic dehydrogenase, um, what we're also seeing is, and this is just reflecting the, the lymphopenia that we're seeing, so lower in, in the non-survivors as compared to the survivors. So see, these are some of the labs that we're looking at um, regularly in our patients, um, particularly IL-6, which has a low turnaround, uh, or a slow turnaround, excuse me, um, and uh, using this to hopefully guide some of our, um, our decisions when it, makes, uh, when it comes to um, looking at uh, possible treatment interventions. Are there guidelines for critical care management? Now, I didn't go into the nit gritty details of management. Um, yes, there are, and they're wonderful. 
Um, so there is the uh, intensive care medicine um, published by uh, SCCM, um, the European Society as well, the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. Um, and then the World Health Organization also um, published uh, these guidelines as well. I highly recommend if you're gonna be in the, in the ICU um, and even if you're admitting any patients to the hospital for reviewing these guidelines, I think they're, they're, um, they uh, um, are, are, are great and, and summarize uh, what we know to date. I did want to spend just the last couple of um, moments um, gearing everyone up and getting everyone excited and um, you know offering this um, you know little ray of hope um, you know really largely headed by Darlene Fusco um, we are moving forward with getting Tulane um, on as a site for several different um, agents the most notable of which are remdesivir the antiviral from gilead and also cerulamab um, which is an il-6 blocker it is really important for us to um, i think uh, participate in the production of high quality uh, randomized control trials such as these so that we can get answers for our patients and, and get some guidance for um, how we're dealing with the complications that we're seeing um, i did also want to put in uh, one big plug in for ClinSeq SIR, which is following clinical outcomes, also collecting um, specimens. Um, what can you do for this? It's very easy. We do ask that every treatment team is just simply asking their patients, are they okay to be, or their family members, are they okay to be contacted by the research team? Um, and we will take it from there. Um, so please do keep those things on your radar. Um, more will be rolling out about these first two trials as well. Um, and let's see here, my very last slide is kind of just to re-emphasize um, kind of the state that we're in and re-emphasize the need that we, that we have for good um, high quality research um, and, and uh, trials. Um, the, uh, for just uh, published quite recently, the, there's been um, some information on the use of convalescent plasma um, to uh, that have neutralizing antibodies against the virus. Um, this has been shown to be effective in, in SARS and some other um, viral illnesses. Um, so the hope is that it would be effective here as well. Um, what we're seeing is um, just uh, data um, showing that there is a, a change or an increase in the cycle threshold um, or the CT values um, in nasal swabs of uh, patients um, meaning that the viral load is, is decreasing, SOFA scores are decreasing, um, oxygenation is increasing, body temperature is decreasing. So this is all great data, but I also just want to point out this was an N of five. Um, so that is what we're looking at. Most of the, da the data that we have um, that is helping us uh, to make our treatment decisions is based on very low N. Um, this, uh, even just based on an N of five, FDA has moved forward with an emergency IND um, and will have this available for severe or immediately life-threatening COVID-19 patients. Um, and with that, I will turn over to Josh. Thank you, Dr. Bojanowski. Let's see if I can get my screen up here. Can you guys hear me, everyone? All right. I am very glad, Dr. Bojanowski, that you did that large thank you slide. I did not uh, have time to get through that. I completely agree. I, I mean, just thank you to all of the nurses and everybody that is um, doing all they can. Um, it's, there's a lot of work that's going on uh, behind the scenes and really everywhere and about. Um, and it, honestly, I don't want to spend too much time but it's so greatly appreciated that um, from the medical student to the nurses, to the um, um, housekeeping, to the chair and dean of the med school. So honestly, I think it's a really a great time where everyone's joining together. I'm gonna talk a little bit, there's probably I think some overlap with what Dr. Bojanowski spoke about a bit, um, but hopefully I will be able to tell you what we've been seeing and what I saw today. Um, and so let's see if I can get my slides to go. Great, so I had three kind of objectives when I put this together, just to review kind of typical characteristics of a critically ill patient with COVID-19. Second is to discuss these most common ICU manifestations that we're seeing and what complications, like we kind of talked about a bit, 
And then just kind of touch base on the evidence-based management strategy that we use to control the ventilator. And the reason I, this last objective I put in here and I want to spend time on is you never know what, we're expecting this number to increase. And you never know if we're going to get to a point where we're asking some of you that are watching this to help us control patients on a ventilator with ARDS. And I think that I don't want to get in the weeds of it, but I think it's important at least to give you the data for, so you know why we're making the decisions we do. So um, as um, Christine mentioned, most patients are admitted uh, with, to the ICU at the end of a week of illness, um, usually seven to, to, to 10 days. It seems to have kind of this a slow onset of disease progression and then dramatically worsens after a week or so. But there is, does seem to be a phenotype that we're observing and we're looking into this with data. Um, definitely higher risk population that have this specific phenotype. And now is this a factor of New Orleans? Uh, I'm not sure, but what we're seeing is a lot of uh, severe obesity, diabetes, and hypertension mostly. We're also seeing a lot of other signs of vascular disease, such as stroke, coronary artery disease, and chronic kidney disease. So again, this is still, when I, if I tell someone this, the question is, well, is this just our typical population? And I would argue that it isn't, and I think it may be a factor in the disease. So this is a study uh, from Guan et al. New England Journal that was published in late January. This, I just cut down their table one to highlight an uh, important fact. This is the largest data out of China. This is over a thousand patients, as you can see up in the, excuse me, uh, over a thousand patients, as you can see. And what I want to highlight, though, is the endpoint. So the primary endpoint, which I, I put in a box in the bottom, was admission to an intensive care, the use of mechanical ventilation, or death. And if you look at that endpoint, and yes and no on the far right, and you look at the comorbidities that these patients have, there is a specific set that is definitely more prevalent in the more severe patients. And they also looked at severe, non-severe non based off other criteria, but I think their outcome of death, mechanical ventilation, and ICU need is, is a great one. And if you look most importantly at, for example, hypertension, 35% of these patients had hypertension, while 13% uh, in, the, in the people that were not severe. Same thing for diabetes, and so honestly, similar findings for coronary artery disease and stroke. And although COPD was more common in this group, honestly, as a pulmonologist, if you ask me who are going to be the at-risk patients to get a respiratory-related virus such as coronavirus, I would immediately jump to a COPD as the most common comorbidity that we'd see. And clearly, they were seeing this over in China. And I can tell you anecdotally, at least, and some data in the US from Seattle, as, as Dr. Bojanowski mentioned, that this is not the case. Um, this seems to be a different uh, pathology related to this disease. Another thing that I noticed is talked a lot about is can cancer and immunodeficiency, and doesn't seem to be a big player in, the, in this disease right now, um, at least from what we know. Again, it, it seems to be a lot of this kind of vascular disease issue related. We don't know much more than that. That's as, as much as we've gone, but we're trying to look into this. Um, this is another study from China, again, to argue that this is not just an American issue or a New Orleans problem. This was actually data that was released from the Chinese government about some of the fatalities they had early on in Wuhan. Uh, in the top uh, graph, the bar chart, they had basically the symptoms, which I don't need to spend a lot of time on, uh, but I do want to look at the bottom one. If you look at the bottom, again, the primary comorbidities that are associated, associated with fatality appear to be hypertension in 50%, diabetes in 40%, um, coronary artery disease, stroke, and again, some chronic bronchitis. But again, the fact that the hypertension and diabetes are leading, I think, uh, really does concern me. And I, um, that's a question that we're looking into right now. Um, so now let's jump a little bit more to the actual disease itself and how does it present and progress and what's our experience. So as we mentioned, we talked about symptoms and lab abnormalities. And in general, people kind of have this a slow burn. It's a slow uh, a slow, low fever over about a week or two, and then the inflammation kind of picks up in the lungs, and that's when people tend to deteriorate. At least that's what we're seeing. So the people will be admitted after a week or so. They rapidly progress in terms of their x-ray findings, as you can see here on the right. This leads to worsening hypoxemic respiratory failure, and then ultimately ARDS, or acute respiratory distress syndrome. We already mentioned some of the complications we're seeing, so I won't go into detail, but renal failure, clots, and shock are all very common. So I want to uh, review some just um, information, I guess, about oxygen therapy and advances that we've had in the past 10 years. And so for the medicine folks, uh, this will be more common knowledge. For non-medicine, maybe not. Um, but as you know, we have a lot of different options nowadays to help people oxygenate. And this comes to play with these patients where the primary problem we're having is maintaining an oxygen level. 
So uh, starting with a nasal cannula, which is 100% oxygen that comes from the wall, it can go up to six liters. I want to mention we have uh, another nasal cannula over the past 10 years that's been used more as a, a stiffer tubing. So it allows more laminar flow and it's a high flow nasal cannula. And that one is still hooked up to the wall. That one can deliver up to 15 liters of oxygen. Now you can also insert a non rebreather mask into this mix, which is probably at this level. And I didn't talk, put that out there yet. Uh, on this slide, but that's something else that can be used. And that's, an, again, 100% oxygen. The next steps um, between, before we actually go to invasive mechanical ventilation, though, ventilation are worth talking about. Heated high flow nasal cannula, or, or the trade name OptiFlow, uh, or made by other companies as well, but OptiFlow is one that's used here, um, has two settings you can set. You can set the rate of the flow, so anywhere from 15 liters all the way up to 60 liters a minute or you can set the, and you can set the oxygen. And this can go all the way from, you know, 21% oxygen of room air, all the way up to 100%. But it's kind of the next level that we'll offer in respiratory failure, especially hypoxemic respiratory failure. The next uh, set that I have here is non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. This essentially is, a, is uh, what the same as a ventilator, but without a tube down someone's throat or an endotracheal tube. Uh, the two options you may be familiar with are BiPAP or CPAP. And right now, in general, the recommendation is to avoid uh, this therapy due to increased aerosolation of the virus and the risk to the healthcare providers. So what's happening in practice in a lot of places, and including here, is that as people progress requiring more and more and more oxygen, they will kind of skip the step from non-invasive pressure ventilation, maybe even the high flow nasal cannula, and straight to invasive mechanical ventilation. And now we don't know the answer for that, but that's really to try to reduce the risk to healthcare uh, um, healthcare workers, and that's what's been used for MERS and SARS previously. Um, and that's kind of what we're doing now, but you know, the again, the data is lacking, and to know if that's the answer, it's, it's hard to say. So ARDS, so I put this in there, obviously I trained, I did my fellowship in Colorado, and I would be remiss if I didn't put a, a picture and some mention of Tom Petty in this slide. So ARDS was discovered there by Tom Petty, as you see in the right hand, in 1967. And the way he discovered this was that one of the hospitals I used to work at, it was actually, um, Anyway, it was a smaller hospital and he was working with a surgeon who uh, they, they had people suffering from ARDS. And he tried uh, putting a pressure in at the end of the breath, which is what's called as PEEP, or positive indexatory pressure. And that was the first time they saw an improvement, published a case series of 12 patients, and we've learned a lot more since then, obviously, about the disease. Uh, ARDS is so that for you, for you guys that want to know, it's defined by the Berlin criteria. It's, it's these kind of uh, few criteria that you have to have in order to say that someone has ARDS. So you need to have an acute insult. You need to have a reason. It can be uh, the flu, it can be a car accident, it could be pancreatitis, but in this case, most virus is from coronavirus. And coronavirus leads to COVID-19, which leads to ARDS. And that's what our patients, unfortunately, are suffering from. You have to have bilateral chest X-ray infiltrates. You need to at least have ruled out or evaluated heart failure to make sure it's not totally due to that. And then the other parameter that you should be familiar with is what we call a P to F ratio. That's a partial pressure of oxygen in the, in the arterial blood to the FiO2 at a level of less than 300 millimeters of mercury. And again, this is on a CPAP or a PEEP, which is that pressure that we give at the end of the, the ventilator's breath of at least five centimeters of water. And that's important to know. And this, this number, the P to F ratio, is how we grade the severity of ARDS. So 200 to 300 is mild, 100 to 200 is usually moderate and less than 100 is severe. And the mortality ranges uh, greatly, but as you can see, it's, it's a severe disease, even at baseline, not in the setting of coronavirus. And as Dr. Bojanowski just discussed, the mortality is even higher for these severe cases on the order of 75 to, you know, upward of 90%. And that's why I'm spending time talking about it. So here's a busy slide. Sorry, Dr. Bottomman. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of this, but I just kind of put this up as I reviewed the guideline management for ARDS that we exist right now, because this is what a lot of us are basing decisions on how we manage a ventilator on. And I want to, I'm only going to talk about the two um, strongly recommended therapies based off of most guidelines, which are lung protective ventilation and prone ventilation. And I'll go through those a bit more in detail. The other therapies listed on here, I'll just mention, are considerations and may be used. Some of those include limiting the amount of IV fluids that we give to a person, or using this higher PEEP strategy compared to a lower PEEP strategy. Also, maybe using paralytics to really just take control of the physiology of the lungs and help someone basically ventilate and oxygenate better. Uh, ECMO or um, VV ECMO is used for ARDS, that, uh, you know, it's like car um, cardiac bypass. 
uh, but we can use it at the bedside occasionally. And then there's those are, have a moderate recommendation in general. Other things have a more conditional recommendation, such as nitric oxide or other advanced ventilator techniques, such as airway pressure release ventilation or driving pressure targets. Um, there are two therapies that are recommended against right now by most guidelines, and that's high frequency oscillatory ventilation, another advanced ventilatory strategy, and then recruitment maneuvers, same thing. Uh, we do need more research still, even though we've been, had corticosteroids for so long, there's still not a right answer. Currently, as Dr. Bojanowski mentioned, the SCCEM surviving sepsis guidelines right now recommend steroids for ARDS from coronavirus, but that's still a um, based off of a weak or at best moderate evidence. And then um, extracorporeal CO2 removal is another form of ECMO that's occasionally uh, considered in ARDS. I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about the studies of why we why these guidelines so strongly recommended lung protective ventilation. This is from a study in 2000. This is one of our two landmark studies for ARDS called the ARMA trial. Um, it was done by the ARDS, Net, ARDS network. This trial was actually stopped early for a benefit in 861 patients. A number of these patients were enrolled here actually in New Orleans. Um, the overall outcome, just to jump to it, was a mortality difference in hospital mortality of 31% in the treatment arm compared to 40% in control arm. Obviously, this is statistically significant. Most importantly, though, it had a number needed to treat of 11, which is really on the order of some of the best therapies that we can offer. So I think that's part of the reason that most ICU clinicians nowadays use this strategy for ARDS patients. So uh, quickly talking about the procedures and how do you give this therapy. Um, so the main premise is that we're, that we're ventilating people with, with a lower tidal volume, that amount of air that we put in and out of the lung with each breath. We're usually targeting six cc's or six milliliters per kilogram, and that's based off of ideal body weight, which is someone's height and sex. So it doesn't matter if you are obese or not, it, it's totally on your, your height and sex, and we give you a certain amount of tidal volume, and we limit that. The reason we limit that is to limit the amount of pressure that is at the end of a breath, and that's called plateau pressure. The reason is we found that high volumes and high pressures have led to injury in the lung, which worsens the inflammation and actually has leads to more worse outcomes, and that's what this trial demonstrated. The other two strategies I mentioned here are permissive hypercapnia, so we're even willing to kind of keep that volume so low that we'll let the CO2 level in the blood rise and let the pH drop a little bit just to target that low tidal volume and low pressure. And, and in this study, they followed what's called this P to FiO2 ladder, and I'll show you that right here. This is actually a table from that paper. Um, as you can see, uh, looking in the red box, these are the two treatment arms. Um, this is how we will basically follow setting some, the amount of oxygen that we're giving to somebody, ranging from 30% up to 100%. And that level of PEEP, that, that first description I gave you that Tom Petty described back in the 1960s. Now we're a bit more aggressive than they were back then. We'll have pushed the PEEP up into the, even the range of the 20s. And this was done in the year 2000 published paper, so done in the 90s. Uh, and so it's something that I don't think we talk about often enough, but I try to emphasize, uh, at least with my trainees when we're on rounds. I'm gonna move on now to the next paper, or the next uh, guideline recommended therapy, and this is called prone ventilation. You may have seen um, patients in Italy on TV that are laying on their bellies, right? And I know that some of the non-medicine folks may have seen that. And that maybe seems strange because most patients in the hospital are on their back. Well, the reason we do this therapy is from this study, which was somewhat recent in 2013. It's called the PROCEVA trial. This is a 466 patient trial. And again, this has been studied since the 1970s, this idea uh, of putting, having people lay flat on their belly, the idea being that the the dorsal aspect of your lungs have more room and, and actually can't, if you allow them to lay on their belly, you'll be able to better match their ventilation and perfusion to um, and improve outcomes. And it took them a while to find the right strategy, but this study had some benefits. So the first thing, who, who do we do this to? So this seems to be best used in the most severe cases. And so that's, again, a P to F ratio of less than 150, meaning it takes their oxygen levels in their blood are low, for a very high amount of oxygen being provided. Um, and also, people that you can see the ventilator setting. So this is someone that is on 60 of oxygen and a PEEP of at least five. So, you know, a moderately severe population. And just to jump right to the outcome, there is a big difference in mortality. And this is 28-day mortality. Now, 16% mortality seems almost too good to be true. And obviously, everything's taken with a grain of salt. But 
you know, if you look at this, the absolute risk reduction is 16%, very statistically significant, with a number you need to treat of only six. And there's, and I, I'll ask anybody in the audience if they have questions of what else, what other therapies do we offer that have a number needed to treat that low, especially for an outcome such as mortality. Um, so what did they do in the study? Just to touch on briefly. So they followed the ARMA trial lung protective ventilation strategy, which I just discussed previously. And then they followed a very specific protocol where people were turned on their belly, usually early in the disease process. So within the first 12 to 24 hours, it wasn't really something that was used later. Um, and then they also did it for a lot longer than they had previously. Other trials had shown better numbers, but never found a mortality or an outcome difference. And in this study, they pushed that, you know, previously they had proned people for eight hours or four hours, sh shorter amounts of time and turned them back. In this study, it seemed that people, the longer they kind of lay on their belly to let, whether it's fluid or inflammation, equilibrate through their lungs, they tended to do better. And actually in these patients, they did this every day, 16 hours for up to 28 days. So some, you know, some patients of ours will do for four days, one day or 12 days and up to 28, you know, that's that, this is following the best evidence that we have. Um, but again, there's a number of issues why you may or may not want to do this. And especially with this disease in particular. Uh, this is a paper from that study just to kind of highlight, it wasn't just 28 day mortality that was significant, 90 day mortality, uh, length of stay, ventilator free days, and then the uh, adverse events were fairly similar uh, between the two groups in terms of pneumothorax, uh, those that required tracheostomy and, and such. So overall, it was, I mean, like I said, it's, it's a very uh, good data for this procedure, um, but it, I think we could still use more and we're pretty limited in our strategies. Like I said, I just talked about the two guideline-based strategies that we have, and they're based off of, you know, short papers. Um, but I, I want to thank everybody for allowing me to talk. Sorry if my slides are fairly simple, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions uh, at any time. This is my email. Uh, and again, I want to thank everyone for attending and for all of the nurses and the respiratory therapists and the housekeeping services that are helping us every day. Because honestly, that I, without them, this would not be moving forward. So thank you guys. Thank you very much. I want to thank both Dr. Bojanowski and Dr. Danson uh, for these uh, excellent presentations. There are a few questions. Uh, I, I will, uh, I'm not going to take them necessarily in order that it's been asked. Uh, uh, let me start with Dr. Danson. Actually, uh, there is a question relating to your last slide, I think. Uh, and the question is, there has been talk among residents about early proning. Is there benefit to ask patients to self-prone if they are able to? starting on admission? That's I think a great question. This, but uh, maybe uh, it's worth repeating. Uh, I heard it. It sounded like, is there any utility in having patients lay on their belly before they are sick enough to be on the ventilator? That sounds like, in general, the question I got. And I'll say the data is scarce in that area. There are a number of, of centers around the country that are considering that and trying that, um, especially as you can I mean, you can predict what's happening in these patients. When you start seeing the inflammatory markers rise and the x-ray changes rise and the level of oxygen needed, you can see what's happening. And knowing that proning does help after intubation, does that help before? Honestly, the jury's still out. There's some data that does support it, but I would argue that the data is not of high quality. I don't know if Dr. Bojanowski has any thoughts additionally, but. Yeah, I think, you know, just to add on to that, um, when, you, it, it, again, it's just um, what we have is so anecdotal. It's so hard to also regulate that as well. Um, and so, yeah, I think the jury's still out, like many of the things that we are looking at. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bojanowski, there's a question directed to you, actually, uh, is, uh, what is uh, what does censoring refer to in the Seattle study? The I'm sorry. What is the what referred to? I, I missed that. Censoring. Censoring. Oh, the censoring. That is a great question, and um, that is I. Okay, I don't want to misspeak, but the censoring I think was just that they had reached the end of the that time frame period, so it was abbreviated data. I think generally incomplete data, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Um, another question repeatedly coming, uh, both Dr. Mushat and I answered it online. Uh, is the association uh, between hypertension and higher incidence of uh, critic, 
critical, uh, critical COVID infection related to uh, ACE inhibitor or ARB use. I want to point out that uh, March 31 issue of New England Journal of Medicine has a uh, very detailed, uh, thoughtful uh, discussion on this. This paper was reviewed by Dr. Navar, uh, and uh, he also asked me to take a look at it. Uh, and the, 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 gen the gist of that paper is uh, the evidence indicates no, but uh, I think uh, people would be interested in uh, you, uh, your opinion, both Dr. Bojanowski and Dr. Danson. Um, so I think, you know, the data that we have to date, I think, again, it's just so, it's just so limited, um, you know, with what is my general approach now to, um, of, to ACE and ARB use in these patients. Um, you know, I, if they were on it, I'm going to keep it on, keep it on. If they're not on it, I'm not going to start it. Um, and that is what I have right now. Um, the, you know, it, that's a great question about the association between hypertension and abuse, and I think that's been um, one of the things we've all been discussing about, e discussing eagerly. Um, I just, again, don't have the numbers for it. Josh, any comments? On uh, yeah, I, I mean, obviously, we don't know. Uh, we're, we're looking at that, and right now, there's, there's conflicting data. You know, there's some data suggesting that our ARBs uh, helpful. Um, and there's some data seeing our ACE inhibitors harmful. And honestly, we really, we really don't know. There is some link though, it seems, you know, people are, um, there is some data looking at the ACE2 receptor, which uh, the coronavirus actually binds to a subunit of that in the lung. And so there may be some association. We really, I, I don't think I would recommend, and I know all of you are thinking about this because we all get, I get asked daily about, should my family member be on this or off this? And right now there's so many questions that we can't answer at the time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and a general question, uh, which keeps uh, recurring as well, uh, hydroxychloroquine. Uh, any comments on that? <clears throat> you know, the data again is 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 not as robust as I would like it to be, um, but that is what we're grabbing, and I think overall that is what most people are grabbing because it is the most accessible. Um, in addition to adding on azithromycin. Um, and again, the data on that is very, is, is very weak at this point, um, but the weighing of the risk and benefit, um, you know, we haven't seen the prolonged, uh, I have not had uh, limitations by prolonged QTC. Um, and so, and there's even variation with the hydroxychloroquine among studies on the appropriate dosing. So I think we've all generally adopted kind of a loose five-day course of both. Um, but again, we're still waiting. I think what's exciting, the World Health Organization is going to be starting a, an international effort to do um, a large, um, a large uh, multiple arm trial looking at the different treatment options that are available, including hydroxychloroquine. Um, I don't think that they're including hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, but that I think would be interesting. Those studies are undergoing, are, are ongoing right now. Thank you. Uh, uh, <clears throat> there's a question on uh, availability of ventilators at uh, Tulane. How are we doing? Uh, do we have adequate supplies? I will tell you that based on our, we have meetings as a section every morning. Um, and I know that there's a command, you know, the command center meeting and, and all of that. We, um, you know, our, we are, um, our units will, are stretched. They will continue to be stretched. Um, so far we are okay on ventilators. I don't want to, I don't want to make it sound like everything's roses, um, but we've not, we've not had uh, to face real limitations to this point. Agree, Josh? Yeah, I think for ventilators, I'm feeling good. You know, I think getting the message out um, that New Orleans in general probably could use more ventilators is an important message. And I would argue that, you know, pr protective equipment, we could use more of that. I think that's something, but um, I think we're okay, at least right now at, on ventilators. And we follow this every day um, and we're preparing the best we can. Okay, there's a question from Dr. Mushat. What role do you think microtrombi may be playing in light of the hypercoagulability? Yes, I think this is so interesting. Um, and so 
Yes, I think it is playing a role. Uh, we have no data to, to full on support that. We do know that the, uh, you know, in China, they were performing autopsies and were able to report on um, the evidence of the microthrombi by as, as well. So, um, yeah, I think it, I think anti, the anticoagulation question um, and is, is a really important one and a really interesting one that we're looking at now. Thank you. Um, another question, uh, either one of you. Do you observe fluid filling the air spaces of the lung in this form of ARDS? Are you concerned that uh, atelectic trauma occurs and could be associated with ventilation-induced lung injury? Do you want me to read that again? I think I can answer it roughly. I mean, I, I th it's hard to answer that fully. Um, you know, it, I will say that what I've noticed anecdotally from these patients compared to a typical ARDS patient is the, the ability to um, reduce the fluid in the lung and see a benefit quickly is, is challenging. And like often ARDS, uh, some patients you can do this in, and some baby patients you just can't. But it seems like all of these you really can't um, see a lot of improvement by targeting fluid removal and whatnot. I do think there's a bigger component of inflammation in the lungs and in the other organs that is um, limiting my ability. Now, that doesn't answer that question. I don't know that I can't answer that question specifically with that electrotrauma, but it's very possible there is some, and that, that's definitely um, still out. Uh, that's my thoughts, at least. Okay, well, moving on. There are a lot of questions. I'm afraid we will not be able to answer all of them, uh, but uh, one of them uh, uh, sounds interesting. Uh, the questioner is uh, curious to know what you people think uh, for healthcare workers on the front line. Do you recommend uh, quarantining f from your families? Mm. Great is question. I texted Josh about this just, just uh, <laughs> a few days ago before going on service. Um, this is, um, you know, this is a very, this is a really scary time for everyone and we want to make sure that we're safe so we can take care of our patients. We want to make sure that we don't bring our work home to our families and that we're not infecting our families. I think that we don't have great guidance on it. I think talking to my colleagues in different parts of the country, uh, there are various extremes of distance, um, you know, and all with way know in terms of risk factors for people that we have at home like what are does do our loved ones have comorbidities that we need to be you know in those cases I would absolutely be getting an Airbnb and staying away from home um, I'm doing a ridiculous dress up dress down stay here <laughs> wash bleach everything stay outside walk home walk into the house not touch anything drop things into the dryer and washer and then go straight to a shower <laughs> for like 20 minutes. <laughs> um, yeah. I think, yeah, I think that's a tough question and it's something everyone's worried about. No one has the answer and whatever makes you feel more comfortable. I think some people are taking it to the extreme. And I think if you are a really high risk group, um, like if I was living with in-laws that were older or something like that, maybe I would take it more extreme. Um, but just like anything, you're taking kind of risk anyway. I mean, I. I'm staying in the house with my wife and kids, but um, you know, I, we try. I could try to change uh, in and out of uh, clean scrubs before leaving the coming to and from the ICU and and leaving. Even then, I still try to wash my I put my clothes in a separate bag. And everyone has strategies. Um, in New Orleans, we're a little bit more forgiving, and other places in New York City, right? They're in an apartment. There's no outside they can change into and things like that. So there's you you make what you can whatever makes you feel most comfortable. Thank you, Mom. The last question is, uh, uh, are we going to move towards prophylactic heparin drips in patients that are not improving on the vent and do not have contraindication to anticoagulants? It's a tough, that's a tough question that I would, you know, I, I rounded today in the ICU and I think I have a couple people on it. Um, I'm seeing more episodes of um, clot uh, related to dialysis catheters uh, as I'm talking to a nephrologist. Um, but there are some patients that it may be a real consideration. It's still too soon to say, and I wouldn't even um, suggest that to anybody yet. It's very, it would be very experimental still, but it's something that some people are trying and the more evidence that we get, the more supported it would be. Yeah, Dr. Bojanowski? Yep. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, 
we have one more. Well, we're, I'm sure, I'm afraid we're at the end of our time. I wanted to thank both Dr. Bojanowski and Dr. Denson for these excellent presentations. We're very grateful for your uh, hard work, uh, all the power to you, and good luck and stay safe. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.